currently at with that. So uh, to begin, before we get started, um, just a few guidelines um, for the webinar. You will be muted um, to prevent interruptions. Please don't unmute yourself during the middle of a presentation um, so that everything runs smoothly. Um, as the presentations are going, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat box and we'll try and answer them at a good moment or after the presentations. If you'd like a certificate of participation, you can write uh, a chat directly to my colleague Saga Kinstrand um, with your name and your email, and then you'll receive an email after the webinar. And um, this webinar is currently being live streamed on the Wiry International YouTube channel. Um, and you can also find it there after the word, afterwards. And the next webinar as part of this Children for Children campaign series will be next Tuesday on the 13th of October at uh, 6 p.m. CST. It's also the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and that will also be the theme and topic of our webinar. So my name is Riza. Uh, I work with the, the FEE head office team primarily with the Young Reporters for the Environment program. And I will just start by um, telling you a bit about our speakers today. We have a lot of them, which is really fantastic. Um, we have uh, Kevin Glinton, who is from our partner organization Brief in the Bahamas. And he is the education coordinator and EcoSchools national operator there. And then we have three schools from the Bahamas, we have teachers and administrators um, from three schools there, from Every Child Counts, from Lukaya International School, and then from Freeport Gospel Chapel School. Um, so we have Lynn Major, Ellen Hardy, Susan Deemer, Dr. Sylvia Bateman, and Helen Tynes. And then we also have from Portugal, which is on the complete other side of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we have uh, Cristina Tavares, who's a teacher there, and then three students, Maria, Fabio, and Anna who will be telling about their experience in participating in the Children for Children campaign. So just a rough structure of this webinar, I will introduce the Children for Children campaign briefly, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation discussion with all of our representatives from the Eco Schools in the Bahamas. Kevin will then give a presentation about coral reefs and the important role that they play um, in the islands of the Bahamas. And then we'll hear from um, Christina and the students in Portugal um, about how they've been participating in the campaign. And then we'll also give you some information on how to join the campaign and participate. And then there will also be time for questions and answers at the end. So to start, the Children for Children campaign. Um, is a foundation for environmental education. It's a campaign that we Can anyone else hear her? Lisa? Whoops. No, I, I just I just sent her. No, a I thought it was my internet. Yeah, I thought it was mine as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's Can you her. guys still hear me? Yes. We now we can hear you. Oh, dear. I lost you for a minute. OK. Let's try that again. Did we get to the Bahamas slide? Not yet, we haven't seen that. Oh, did we see the previous slide? <laughs> yes, we stopped on that slide. Okay, cool. Then we'll just pick it up uh, from where we left off. Um, the Bahamas, just a brief introduction so that we have some context. Um, it's made up of more than 700 islands, caves, and islets in the Atlantic Ocean, kind of between the United States and Cuba. The population is around 385,000 as of 2018. The capital is Nassau, and it's about seven times smaller than Portugal. Um, and the total land, about 35% of 
the Bahamas total land area is coastline. Um, so there's a lot of beaches <laughs> and a lot of sea around it. Um, the Children for Children campaign kind of came about um, because of Hurricane Dorian, which was a category five hurricane that hit the Bahamas on September 1st in 2019. And it stayed for three days and caused a whole lot of damage, about $3.4 billion worth in damage. It left about 70,000 people homeless um, and an estimated 13,000 homes, um, which is about 45% of the homes in, the, in Abacos and Grand Bahama Islands were uh, damaged or destroyed. Um, which leads us to um, why FEE got involved. Um, there are 12 of um, eco schools in the Bahamas were severely damaged or impacted by Hurricane Dorian. Um, three schools representatives are here today. So from Every Child Counts, from Freeport Gospel Chapel School and Bukai International School. And that fee decided then uh, to launch in partnership um, with our partner in the Bahamas, the Bahamas Reef Environment Education Foundation, Brief, to launch this campaign in order to support the recovery of these 12 affected eco schools in the Bahamas. The goal of the campaign overall was to um, increase awareness about the vulnerabilities that um, places face um, in the face of natural disasters due to climate change, and then to directly support the schools um, affected by mobilizing the global eco schools network that we are a part of um, and to, to raise money and help in the recovery. Um, overall, we had, there were four objectives identified increase awareness and actions among young people for disaster risk reduction and resilience, um, to increase awareness of vulnerabilities due to climate change um, and strategies to meet the climate change uh, challenge, uh, to create increase empathy, empathy and a sense of global community um, within the Eco Schools Network, and then to empower students and give them the skills to plan activities and initiate positive action um, in their school communities. Um, this is overall the, the purpose of the campaign. I will explain more on how to participate after our presentations. Um, but for now, and now I would like to invite our representatives from the three schools in the Bahamas if they could just introduce themselves and their school, um, and we can get a, a conversation started. Does anyone want to volunteer to go first? Okay, I'm sorry, I can put my camera on. No worries. Good morning, I'm Sylvia from Lakaya International School in the Bahamas. Um, what Do you want us to go through anything about our school? Sure, you can, if you'd like to just introduce yourself and then maybe how your school was impacted during Hurricane Dorian and then maybe what where you're currently at would be a good well, Following the hurricane, we couldn't move into school. So we actually relocated. The primary school was sent off to a hotel. The secondary school, we were have, had lessons in different people's houses just so we could continue education. And some of that was the parents came in and said that their kids had lost everything. They weren't going to lose their education. So we were determined to keep education going. However hard it was, and it was, I don't think it was easy being in a hotel, although I think the hotel was a very good thing for the kids because it was a new environment and that gave them something to look forward to when the, everything else was a disaster. So I think that was very good. It took, one of the problems was an awful lot of the equipment and things were thrown away and those still haven't been replaced. So we have got a smaller, well, the facility is still there, but the resources have reduced, which isn't particularly good. Um, COVID has not helped that in one tiny little bit because it's harder to get things in and following the hurricane, getting things onto the island was not an easy feat. Mm. But compared to other schools where they lost the whole school, I think we were better off. 
we were just badly damaged with mold and we couldn't move in immediately. Um, I think that the stronger students, I think, were better off. I think the weaker students have suffered. Sorry. Environmentally, I think that those students, a lot of the projects that they were on or were working on to start with were just, just totally destroyed. So it was a matter of we're going to have to start again. And how are we going to start a game from the mess that we've now got? So that's something which has impacted them quite dramatically. I think some of them have just lost their their push there because they just they put a lot of work in and now they've got to start from scratch. And I think for small kids that's not always easy. Right. I don't think it's easy for anybody, but I think it's harder for them. Right. Um, environmentally, I think the oil spill we had here has been had quite a big impact on them because they've done quite a lot of research on that following the hurricane. And so I think educationally they have advanced, but whether we have necessarily done too much for the environment is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Is that is that okay? That's excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you also for bringing up COVID. Um, because that's something the whole world was kind of dealing with. Um, and that happened quite, it's been a year since Hurricane Dorian, a bit over a year. And then a few months later, COVID hit the entire world and everyone was dealing with a crisis. Um, but it's extra hard if you're recovering from a hurricane and also trying to deal with a global health pandemic. Um, so thank you for raising that as well. Um, anyone next speaker? We can get um, every child counts. And, yes, um, I. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Um, there's three of us from every child counts. Uh, myself and uh, Lynn Major. I'm the founder and the um, administrator of the school. Um, it's and Susan Deemer and Ellen Hardy, who's in charge of the eco programs at the school. Um, so Every Child Counts is in the middle of Marsh Harbor, uh, which was devastated almost completely by Hurricane Dorian. So our campus was under about eight to 10 feet of water when the storm surge and the wave after the storm surge came ac across. So we had um, over 20 years built or a self-funded school. We raised all the money. It's a special needs school for um, children with any kind of struggles or challenges. Um, and we had just completed our last building, which was a transitional living facility for young adults, was intended to be. Um, the building um, was severely damaged as was every other building. Um, we had about, we figured about $1.7 million worth of damage in the school. None of the buildings were usable. Uh, at what after the storm, all the equipment, all the um, computers, everything, because everything was, there was eight to 10 feet of water in the school. So luckily, um, and, the, and we also lost a teacher um, during the hurricane. She wasn't at the school, but she was lost in the, in the storm. So, so it was quite devastating for our school for our community. It's quite devastating for all of Abaco, um, especially Marsh Harbor. Um, I was not in Marsh Harbor. Susan lived in Marsh Harbor at the time. I was. I live in Elbow Key, so we're a small key um, that suffered damage. About 90% of our homes were damaged or lost, uh, as in the mainland, but, um, but we had no loss of life, which was a blessing for us. Um, so since then, we were lucky. We were blessed to have a number of NGOs, including All Hands and Hearts and um, GER3 and Youth on a Mission, who've committed to helping us rebuild the school. We presently we have um, no building completed, <laughs> one almost completed. Uh, we have, um, but mainly due to the fact that in March, most of the NGOs had to leave due to COVID. Um, so they're just returning now and uh, work has just begun and is going quite well. But 
we were out of school, obviously, all of last year. Um, some of most of our staff was evacuated. Um, uh, we came back in March um, and in order to try to help rebuild the school, but because as we came back, COVID hit the Bahamas seriously and they the NGOs had to leave. So, so progress has been slow. We're just getting ready to try to do remote learning um, next week, try and start, which is Susan's um, kind of baby trying to get it going, which is a challenge with special needs children. You know, we have some children who are learning disabled and able to hope, we hope able to adjust to that environment. It's going to be more difficult for the more severely challenged students to, but we're trying, you know, our idea is to try to reconnect the school, try and reconnect the children with the school because the children um, have a great need at this point um to try and get some normalcy back to their lives and try and return to um their community we were uh we had 106 students and 20 25 staff about um and we were a community so that that has also been devastated uh, devastating for most of us on abaco to lose um as much as we lost but also to see our communities broken. So the effort right now is to regroup those communities and reconnect and try and bring some, uh, try and get back to some sense of normalcy, which as people have previously said, is not easy due to the COVID situation. So um, it's been a challenge and it still is a challenge I know um, for every school that's been here for every community that's been here, it's a challenge. So that's the basic basic situation. <laughs> so I will say as we rebuild um, that it's been um, a blessing in the rebuilding to try to focus on ways to improve our safety, you know, in terms of future disasters, in terms of strength of buildings, in terms of um, we have, we had started uh, solar um, on a few of our buildings. And so we've just had an offer, uh, which we're working on now to try to extend that. We still don't have power. We, we have passed power, um, the inspection to reconnect power, but we have, there's still some poles that have to be put up. So the school grounds, we have one or two buildings that are, they are using the solar, the solar that we had in, um, for um, energy, which is great. And we're trying to expand that. And we also have a NGO called Water Mission, who's um, building, working with us to build a water catchment system that would help, would certainly help in terms of providing water on a regular basis. And if there was, there were, should be another storm. So, so while we're going, we're trying to, um, um, expand on what we've done and trying to move from there. Excellent. Thank, thank you for sharing. Uh, a basic but rather complicated situation, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned um, I, don't know if, um, hmm? I don't know if anybody from Freeport Gospel is here, is on the, the um, webinar. If they are, could they unmute themselves? Because I don't see the name. If not, we have Jim Richards from right down the road from Every Child Counts. He's on he's on the webinar and he'll be and he's graciously consented to talk about his experience, his school's experience. Um, I'm not gonna say anything more. He can tell you more than more than I can about um, the experience. His school is Forest Heights Academy, another green school, green flag school in um, Abaco. Jim. Good morning. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it's so good to see Lynn and Sylvia and Susan and Ellen and all my colleagues from Grand Bahama and Abaco. Uh, I was the principal of Forest Heights Academy for the last 14 years. Um, we were located near the airport in Marsh Harbor, so we didn't have substantial flooding, but we did lose our roof. Um, so all of the contents of all the buildings were, were destroyed with, with water. Um, We've completely gutted the school and 
it's taken a full year, but we have replaced the roof uh, through the help of nonprofit organizations. The, the ADRA, Adventist Disaster Relief Authority, has come in and done the roof. We're hoping to open uh, next September. So it'll be closed for two full years. Um, I think the thing that Lynn said is that's most poignant to me is just the loss of community. You know, I lost my house, I lost my school, I lost my job but you also lose your whole community. You lose that connectivity with people and, and we're scattered. My, my 150 students are scattered from, you know, Wisconsin to Jamaica and every island in the Bahamas and across the globe. And, and you can replace documents, you know, you have cloud-based transcripts and things. You can replace those things, but you can't, you can never get that sense of community back. You know, you lost your, your school community, your coworkers. Um, so it's, it's more than just the physical destruction of the school, that, that takes time and that'll be repaired. But that connectivity you have with your community has been, has been really difficult for a lot of my students. You know, they, they come from a small island. A lot of them were in school together from kindergarten until the, until the hurricane. And in that same class of 24, 25 kids, you know, for eight, nine, 10, 11 years, and then you lose that. Um, and end up starting over. So that, that's been really um, difficult for a lot of my students. Thanks, Jim. Um, thank, yeah, thank you all for sharing. Maybe uh, one more question. Um, is there a lesson or a piece of advice that after this experience that you would give to other eco schools that are at risk of disasters, whether natural or otherwise, or maybe even in relation to um, COVID now as a crisis? Is there any takeaway? My biggest takeaway would be to have everything online, you know, scan those documents, scan immunization records. Um, have access to your grade books online. Students are still gonna need to get into college. They're still gonna need to apply for scholarships. Um, if, you have, if you have their documents scanned and saved in the cloud, it, it really makes, it, it, it lessens one burden on those families and those students. Um, I would agree with Jim. I. Um, for our administration and just to keep in mind as you're rebuilding whatever um, whatever steps you can take to make things a bit more secure. Um, my, some of our buildings were quite old, so um, there, there are things that can be done. I think the biggest challenge for us that we're trying to find out, find is because we are a special needs school, um, learning, virtual learning or remote learning is difficult. And, uh, and the nature of our school was to, um, was to provide a healing and a, a, a nurturing environment for our students. And for many special needs students that takes one-on-one um, -on -one and um, manual work and they were work, working in the community at different places and in, in stores, grocery stores. And so we, we are trying to struggle through figuring that out. So I don't know if there are other special needs communities among, you know, among this uh, pop of your population who might have suggestions for that. But for us, that's the biggest, the biggest challenge that we're trying to figure out how to move on with. Um, out, of, out of interest, how many children are left in Abaco? Uh, we have gathered back Hello. about about 40 uh, of ours of the 106. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows. Um, we know we've contacted most of our children, so we know we contacted them. We had a group of teachers who evacuated to Nassau, and we continued to pay them to work. Um, with our students who were evacuated in other schools and also to offer assistance to some of the special needs schools in Nassau. Um, so we were able to keep track of many of our students and keep in touch with them. Um, I, th I think at one point, Jim, you may know better than me, but I think at one point um, somebody gave the figure 2,000. 
2,000 um, students. She's on the... So, uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, it's very, right now in Abaco is a very fluid situation. So one day you have, you know, you, you find one or two, the next day you find three or four. So people are, people are trying to come back. People are trying to find homes. The biggest crisis is homes for people, places for people to stay. So as they are able to find them, they come back. And so the, the number changes quite, quite frequently. I would say 90% of Abaco was of the parts that were hit with the hurricane. Southern, South Abaco wasn't. So those communities stayed, many of them stayed. Um, but for the central and the keys, that 90% of people after Dorian were evacuated. So it's just been a process of slowly being able to come back. Absolutely. Thank you. For sure. Sylvia, do you, do you mind if I ask? Absolutely. Um, um, we have at ECC, we have registered between 65 and 70 students right now. And I believe the Ministry of Education's estimate is we have over a thousand students on island at the moment. Um, so trying to gather those students together is, is a challenge because their living conditions um, can be, you know, there's, there's people in tents, they have no electricity, no, um, no Wi-Fi. So we're having to get them devices and whatnot. So living conditions are still a huge challenge mm -hmm. um, in, in the Marsh Harbor area. So that's one of the biggest things. One, and one of the, one of the positive things is because we've been able, because we are trying to do remote learning, we have been able to reach some of our students who are on other islands, not um, who have difficulty finding um, schools. And as we have one we've located in Inagua, um, and I don't think there's any special needs schools in Inagua. We have a program for um, older, our older students. We started a program for young adults as our students aged over the 20 years we've been in existence. So one of the blessings is that some of those registered students are students who are not actually on Abaco, but because it is remote learning, we can, we can actually reach out to them and offer them something, you know, or at least a connection with their friends and their community. Um, so. So that, that has been a blessing that the number that are actually, as Susan said, the number that are actually on Abaco changes dependent on whether they, where they can find some place to be, you know, somewhere to live. We have a number of, most of our staff in Marsh Harbor, all of our staffs lost their homes or their, where they were living. So just to bring staff back as Jim would have that same experience just to bring staff back is presented the question of well where do they go <laughs> where do, where do they live you know and and so we've used we have our trend the transitional living residence we had just finished was livable so we brought a couple of staff um, back to stay there until they can um, find other places. One is living in now in a trailer with his family. So, so that has been, you know, that has been a, a big um, effort to, to try and for everybody, for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, sounds incredibly difficult. Um, I want to be very mindful of the time. We have uh, two presentations still. So uh, we could maybe move on to Kevin, kind of looking forward now, maybe what are in general ways that um, the Bahamas can protect itself from natural disasters and how other people around the world can uh, contribute and help out. So Kevin, take it away. Okay. Um, so good morning. I was introduced earlier. Um, Kevin Glinton, Education Coordinator at Brief and National Operator for for Eco Schools. And um, so the 
the the oceans connect the spoil archipelagic nature of the Bahamas, and it helps to define who we are and how we live. Our, our marine and coastal environments influence every aspect of our lives. As a coastal nation, the Bahamas relies heavily on the ecosystems of the coral, that the coral reefs provide. In fact, it is, our, it is our first line of protections against storm surge and waves from storms and hurricanes. So let's get started on this brief journey into coral reefs that it's important to the Bahamas. In this presentation, um, we would like to look at basically what are coral reefs, what are corals, why they're important and so special to the Bahamas in protecting the Bahamas from natural disasters exacerbated by climate change. We're gonna look at some threats to the survival of coral reefs. And we're gonna look at some of our coral reef conservation efforts here in the Bahamas that Reef is involved in. So a coral reef is a wave resistant limestone structure built predominantly by the accumulation of coral skeletons over hundreds and thousands of years. A reef is made up of colonies of tiny invertebrate animals living in close relationship with many other marine organisms. Worldwide, reefs are home to more than 4,000 species of fish, 7,000 species of coral, and thousands of other plants and animals. One third of the wider Caribbean regions Coral reefs are located right here in the Bahamas. Where do we find coral reefs? Near land in tropical waters, they make up just um, over 1% 1, 1 of the ocean floor, but are some of the most diverse places, but are found in some of the most diverse places on Earth. Coral reefs prefer water temperatures of 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And here, here on this um, slide, you see the coral reefs of the Bahamas, which are found on the windward side. In other words, the side facing the prevailing wind or trade winds. In fact, the, the Andrews Barrier Reef is the third largest barrier reef in the world and stretches more than 140 miles along the east coast of, the, of Andrews Island. And I'm gonna put my point that's Andrews there. Abaco here, which is where um, Jim and Ellen and um, Susan, those are. Um, so right now, I want to just show you a short film by Living Oceans Foundations, illustrating better than I could, I think, and 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 in and more more and better time how corals grow and feed. A coral reef. It can be one of the liveliest places on Earth. But what's really surprising is how much more goes on here than meets the eye. Even the corals themselves are alive. They're made up of tiny animals called coral polyps, distant cousins of jellyfish. Hundreds, even thousands of polyps can make up a coral. And this impressive reef, they built it, millimeter by millimeter. How? A polyp is mostly stomach, with a mouth on top. It sits in a hard skeleton that's part of the reef. The polyp takes in dissolved minerals from the water and mixes them with proteins. Then it rises up out of its skeleton, leaving space below. It deposits calcium carbonate, also known as limestone, into this space. Over time, each little polyp not only builds its own skeleton, but adds to the structure of the reef. So what gives the polyp the energy for all this building? A unique partnership Inside most reef-building polyps are tiny algae called zooxanthellae. They use energy from the sun to photosynthesize, producing up to 95% of the food the corals need. As animals, the corals emit nutrients valuable to the algae too, and also give them a protected place in which to live. 
This trade-off benefits both the algae and the corals. It's called a symbiotic relationship. The algae are even responsible for the colors we identify with corals. The resourceful little polyps feed in other ways too. They can't move to get food, but they make up for it. At night, they rise up out of their skeletons to feed, stretching their long tentacles to snatch zooplankton and other food particles passing by. This amazing time-lapse footage was taken at night under bright lights. Polyps' tentacles are studded with thousands of stinging cells called nematocysts. They catch prey by piercing it and releasing toxins. And then the polyp uses its tentacles to place the prize into its mouth. Most coral polyps also have an outer layer of mucus that aids in feeding. It acts almost like flypaper trapping dissolved nutrients from the water and sediment. The polyp draws the mucus into its gut with hair-like projections called cilia. Some coral polyps can even share nutrients with each other. In coral colonies, the stomachs of polyps are connected by a tissue called cenosarc. This allows individual polyps to work together like one big organism. Okay, so reefs, um, there, there are two types of reefs, two types of coral, sorry. Um, they're the middle of hard coral colonies, next to and on top of each other. And some examples of, of hard corals, mustard hill, blue brain coral, looks like a classic human brain. The star, great star coral has a big belly button shaped polyps and is one of the easiest to observe. And the boulder brain coral, which is the largest of all brain corals that have a very defined, often bicolor septa or separations. Then we have our soft corals. We have the pillar or branching corals. We have the finger, also called club finger corals. And we have staghorn corals, the endangered corals that Brief is growing um, right now. Now let's move on to the, sorry, examples of soft corals. Um, soft corals have no limestone skeleton. They are soft and feathery and you can see them waving around in the current. Soft corals, soft coral polyps connected by fleshy, they're connected by fleshy tissue and they have no limestone skeleton. Unlike hard corals, which have smooth tentacles, soft coral tentacles have, have a feathery appearance. Now that we've learned a lot about coral reefs, so let's learn about some of the benefits that coral reefs provide to the Bahamas and why they are so special and important to us. Again, about a third of all organisms on the planet can be found in the oceans. Coral reefs cover less than 1% of the sea floor, but support over 25% of all marine life. Coral reefs maintain diversity, and coral reefs provide essential habitats for juvenile and key species. Our favorite foods are found on, on the coral reefs, like crawfish, grouper, and conch. We provide income for the Bahamas and livelihood for many Bahamians. In fact, our number one industry is tourism. Um, you know, millions of people come here each year from the beaches, the seafood, the snorkeling, the diving, and I'm the artist. The Bahamas is also known as the shark diving capital of the world, which provides over $119 million a year in shark diving tourism alone. And it provides jobs for fishermen, restaurant workers, and hotels. We love the water. It's a place for recreation for Bahamians to relax and um, healing. As far as we concerned, it has healing properties also. The bomb is also the largest, the third largest ship registry in the world. 
it's still cheaper to transport goods and people via the sea. Coral reefs are sometimes considered the medicine cabinets of the 21st century. Coral reef plants and animals are important sources of new medicines being developed to treat cancer, arthritis, human bacterial infections, Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, viruses, and other diseases. The Bahamas has about 2,200 2, miles of coastline. Anywhere you go in the Bahamas, you're never more than three miles away from the, the beach. So in terms of shoreline protection, that's very, very, very important for us also. Okay, and coral reefs are our first line of defense against storm surge, like I said earlier, and waves of storms and hurricanes, reducing wave energy by 97% and wave height by 84%. Imagine how devastating hurricanes would be if coral reefs disappeared in the Bahamas. Natural threats have been around for centuries, but humans are the biggest threat. I briefly use the acronym CHOPPY to help us remember the human-induced threats to coral reefs, and they are climate change, habitat destruction, overfishing, pollution, invasive species, and trade. And I'm going to go through these. So um, corals are very sensitive and need, like I said, ocean temperatures between 70 and 85 degrees. When the water gets warmer, like it's doing now in our climate crisis, coral expels, expels their zooxanthellae, their main source of food, so they start to starve, and the white skeletons can be seen through clear tissues, and this is called coral bleaching. Examples of habitat destruction, unstable coastal development, in which plumes of sand kill corals, physically breaking corals by careless divers or, or careless cruise ships, mowing down coral reefs, and an anchoring on them. Overfishing or taking out more than nature can replace. In the Bahamas, sharks, our apex predators, have been protected by law since 2011. And another form of just as harvesting spiny lobster during this reproductive season, which is the eggs here on the spiny lobster. Many types of pollution um, threaten coral reefs, including wastewater, um, oil leaks, illegal dumping from cruise ships, and of course, plastics. Invasive species like the lionfish are not, are not native to the Bahamas and compete with our native species and eat their juveniles. They have spread throughout the Bahamas, upsetting our natural, our native marine ecosystems. They reproduce uncontrollably with no natural predators and reach sexual maturity very rapidly. They eat everything. In the Bahamas, it is also illegal to damage or remove any sea life from the ocean and coral reefs. Illegal trade in the endangered, endangered and protected species like Bahamas rock iguana and the Bahama parrot and queen, queen count is also discouraged and um, punishable by law. Reef and its partners are committed to protecting 20% of our environment by 2030. Um, we recently um, helped out in, in crafting the Coral Reef Protection Act, which has been submitted and is now under consideration. Reef has been involved in oil monitoring, especially at our Coral Reef Sculpture Garden, picture here, um, the world's largest underwater sculpture um, from 2015. Reef has been restoring reefs since 2015 at the Coral Reef Sculpture Garden. In summary, Coral reef ecosystems are important to the Bahamas by providing all of these important benefits or services, biodiversity, food security, income, and recreation, new sources of medicine, and more importantly, in this era of climate crisis, shoreline protection. Let us do our part by helping to reduce human threats to coral reefs. Let your voice be heard and spread the word about coral reef conservation. Thank you much, and if there are any questions. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. Um, so while uh, I think we should all be doing our part to uh, combat climate change, specifically for the Children for Children campaign, there are ways that you as a student, as a teacher, as a school community, can help support the eco schools in the Bahamas. 
And we have one uh, very fantastic uh, participant, participating group uh, from Portugal. Uh, Cristina Tavares is here. She's a teacher um, and with three students who have been actively participating in the Children for Children campaign and have been able to raise some money and, and do kind of fundraising activities. So thank you so much for being here, uh, Christina. And if you'd like to uh, tell us a little bit about how, how you've participated in the Children for Children campaign, um, and maybe this can be a, a source of inspiration for others. Hi, uh, I'm Christina. I'm still uh, trying to see my presentation <laughs> to show you. Uh, oh, let's see where is she. Maybe she's not doing it. Are you seeing my presentation? <laughs> okay, um, so as I said, I'm uh, Christina, I'm a teacher from biology and biology and uh, I'm also the Eco School Coordinator. I have with me Maria from uh, eighth grade, uh, Fabio and Anna, both from uh, 11th grade. And uh, we are from uh, Agrupamento Escolas do Pastrafim Lake in Portugal. <laughs> Children campaign uh, started in the last uh, school year as a eco school activity, but uh, partnerships were quickly established with our, the teachers and students of other projects that we have in school, like uh, School Friends of Human Rights or Solidarity Schools, and also uh, Erasmus Project. Um, as well as with uh, some class projects, uh, for example, the project of the 7D uh, class uh, from uh, where Maria belongs, um, and also the project class of the uh, four uh, classes of the 10th grade uh, from where Fabio and uh, Anna belongs. We also had uh, some support from the parish of the city and also from two companies, uh, Viarco, that is a pencil factory, and the Elio Textil is a textile factory. So as I told you, uh, 
the project started in um, in the first eco council meeting um, where I presented the proposal uh, that I had saw in the um, website of the eco school international um, and um, in the beginning our um, ob objective was uh, uh, Bahamas and uh, the 12 schools that we saw that were very damaged with the uh, Dorian hurricane. But Maria Plus uh, had another purpose. We help the school in Colombo and Goma that had a lot of problems such as the installations itself and structural problems. There were absence of sanitary facilities, lack of space for all students. Um, there were no seals, so the kids were unprotected. And so their parents didn't have the same early sleep hours when they sent us to school. Um, there wasn't the playground. Their supposed playground was only clay. And beyond the, the, the classrooms were full. There were about 700 kids that were in place at the beginning of the year school. Those kids, those who have the same right of education, they don't. It. As it says here in the PowerPoint, together we are stronger. To be able to help everyone, uh, we must uh, work together to give equal chances to, to everyone, including Angola and Ghana. In order to produce the pencils for the fundraising, my class did multiple designs for what was going to be the final model for selling. The shoes in mind was this model, uh, and the pencils were produced by Diarco, a very well known company based at Central Madrid. The different colors of the pencils were based on Dolphic symbols. They represent the five continents celebrating the diversity. Without the pencils, probably we would not be able to raise the, the amount necessary for the construction. A seventh day student of financial support from a textile company in the city, Elliot Castle, using a graphic proposed by the students of the seventh day, produced and offers the light of the right that you can see below. Students from the uh, 10th C, D, E, and F produced the graphics for the pins that you can see as well. The Southern Madeira Parish Council provided the support with the purchase of the pin making machines we used to make everything needed. We are all working for the different rights for everyone. For example, we have the Article 26 from the Human Rights Charter. Everyone has the right to education. And we have also the third article in rights of the child. The child will be entitled to receive education, which will be free at least in primary school. And we are also working for the human values to have equality, justice, solidarity, empathy, resilience, equity, and so on. We also work for the sustainable development goal we have 17 of them, and we are working here with three. Um, quality education, so everyone can be educated and have the same possibilities. Uh, climate action, to preserve our planet Earth, and it's, so it stays beautiful. And the 17, partnership for the goals. It means that we have to work all together to achieve those goals. Um, the campaign started early 2020, but because of the pandemic, our schools had to close and we were sent home and having online classes, but, and the project was put on standby. But doesn't mean that it was terminated because we want to help and we will not give up uh, until we help Bahamas and Nagoya. The campaign to sell pencils, bracelets, and pins is once again gaining momentum from students and teachers 
from three schools in the group. At the end of the year, we want to deliver the funds raised to the two causes, Bahama and Angola. So, as we, you can see here, uh, you have our logo and our motto. The logo uh, is a uh, leaf, <laughs> and our motto is, uh, as you can see, it's, we build the future. So, uh, we want to continue. We uh, will do everything we can with our small drops <laughs> to build a big ocean and a better world. Uh, we want to to help uh, Angola and Bahamas. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That was great. I think it also shows that uh, there's a lot to be to be learned from running a, a campaign um, and raising money and all the work that you're doing is, is really, really excellent. So thank you so much and keep up the good work. Um, for anyone else on this webinar who is interested in participating in the Children for Children campaign, um, it's still running and will continue to do so at least for the next school year. Um, and there's a few ways to participate. So overall, the general idea is that you would organize and run an awareness campaign um, that about the impacts of climate change and disaster risk reduction. And this would include fundraising activities uh, from which the donations can then help support schools in the Bahamas. Um, Eco schools and FEE have kind of listed some ideas. We realize now with COVID, not all of these are possible. However, I think as the students in Portugal show, um, there are ways around it. We have also heard from other schools who have been doing virtual sponsored runs or other virtual activities and events um, to raise money. All of this information can be found on the Eco Schools website, which um, has a number of educational materials that um, students and teachers can use that we've compiled. Uh, so we have a lesson plan. It's a three-part lesson plan that's been created. Um, and it has parts on climate change, disaster risk reduction, and then organizing and writing a fundraising campaign. And that could be for Eagle Schools, young reporters could get involved, um, really any students. Uh, and there's also um, um, tools from UNESCO and um, as well, and Eco Schools materials on disaster risk reduction, um, as well as some other things. So we strongly encourage people to participate. I think it would be really great. Um, I think you learn so much more um, from helping others. If anyone has any questions at this moment about the campaign, about the Bahamas, um, feel free to, to speak up and ask or put it in the chat. No. All right. Any, any, to be mindful of time, any closing comments, maybe from Brief or from our teachers in the Bahamas? I can jump in here. Hi. Um, and thank you so much, Riza, for organizing this. And thank you all for, for joining in and really caring about this issue. I think it's been, um, it really helps sort of rebuilding a, a sense of community for children in the Bahamas to realize that actually there are people around the world who care about what's going on. Um, and no, it doesn't replace um, the communities that have been seriously impacted um, and that sense of community that's that's been lost because of the hurricane. But um, I know our brief team has been going into schools and sharing some of the videos of support from children around the world we compiled a number of those um, videos, very short videos from kids saying that they are um, supporting children in the Bahamas. Um, and that really means a lot to us. So thank you for those of you who have done that. Um, and please do, do more of those, that's great. Um, also the issue of climate change really can't be underestimated. The Bahamas is a very low lying country. Um, the highest point in the whole country is 206 feet above sea level. Um, and when we hear about schools having 10 feet of water in their schools, um, it really sends this message home. So um, thinking about what countries can do to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions um, and address climate change in their own countries, um, understanding the impacts that it has on a low-lying island nation like the Bahamas. 
um, and thinking about changing our energy consumption. Um, we're having discussions right now about the, in the Bahamas about drilling for oil um, and Brief is really pushing, <laughs> pushing back against that saying, actually let's come up with um, green alternatives and prepare our students for a post um, uh, oil future. Um, that's what we're, we're trying to, to work towards. So help with all of that. Um, and then obviously you can hear that our, our schools still really, really need support. So we, we appreciate you putting these webinars together and, um, and connecting the world. Okay. Lisa? Yes? This is Daniel. Can I say something? Yes, please, Daniel. All right. Just a second. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Jaffa. I'm the uh, CEO of the Foundation for Environmental Education. And um, I just wanted to thank you all for participating. I wanted to thank Riza for a fantastic facilitation job. Uh, you've been moderating this very nicely. Thank you, Riza. Um, but I think that for me, um, one of the things that I think that, you know, we were thinking about when we initiated this was that um, this is not going to go away. Um, climate change isn't going away, unfortunately, and we are going to see more and more of our schools and our communities around the world uh, affected one way or another by, um, by the changes that um, are occurring. And, and that um, th there should be a meaning to the fact that we're part of this eco-schools network, that we're part of something which is bigger than just what we are. And that we can um, relate um, to uh, the troubles or the suffering of um, fellow students, even in countries that we haven't been to or children that we have never met or maybe will never meet. But I think that if we're looking at the challenges that we're facing at the moment, this is the kind of psychic that we have to have. We have to be um, taking actions. We have to... Um, stop doing certain things because we think about other people. And, and, and for me, this was a very important um, part of this, um, that you know, we say that we're part of a network, that we're uh, this family of schools. It has to mean something in the end of the day when one of our family is, um, is suffering. So I think this is, this is um, an important, um, important point for me that I would I would be very happy uh, if we could spread around through our networks and, and get more um, children and more teachers and just people uh, to think about these things. And, and I, I, I am very thankful for the school from uh, Portugal, uh, Cristina and, and the three students with you, I guys. I appreciate not only your presentation, but 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 this effort that you have taken in your school. I think it's exam. It's an example of exactly the point I'm trying to raise, and I hope that more schools will uh, follow in your footsteps. And as you know, it it could be a hurricane in the Bahamas, but it could also be uh, fires in the north of Portugal. Nobody's immune to this anymore, and we need to think about each other if we want to make a change. So that's just my two cents. Thank you, Riza. Thank you. On that note, I don't, I don't think I can really follow that, um, but absolutely, um, please keep this in mind. Um, we have another webinar next week that will be specifically about disaster risk reduction, and it would be great if you could all join us for that as well. It's at 6 p.m. CST. Um, any other last, last words? No. All right. Then with that, I will end this webinar. Thank you all for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your week and hopefully see you next Tuesday. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic meeting.